Hey, welcome everyone. This is the last ESS lecture of the uh, fall 2021 semester. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a preview for what's coming up. We've, uh, we have a slate of four speakers for the uh, spring semester, but have not yet sorted out dates. And we are also, I guess, as restaurants call it, we're going to do a soft reopening of in-person lectures. Uh, we are planning on flying Dennis Walsh, a philosopher at the University of Toronto, into uh, Columbia uh, to give a talk. We will also have two speakers here from Columbia, uh, Carol Ward, who is an anatomist and paleoanthropologist, and also Roger Cook who is in, this, uh, in the uh, Department of German and Film Studies. And then the fourth speaker is Simon Losa, who just got a professorship at the University of Nijmegen in political philosophy, I believe. Uh, that will be our speaker series for next semester, dates uh, and abstracts and titles uh, coming up. Uh, today, I am very pleased to introduce you to Heidi Collerin. She is currently at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. She is a group leader in the Department of Human Behavior, Ecology, and Culture. Uh, she did her PhD work at the University College London, is that right? UCL, uh, studying with Ruth Mace. And her research interests include sociocultural anthropology, demography, cultural evolution, and she has fieldwork experience in both, she maintains field sites in both Poland and Vanuatu. Uh, please give a virtual greeting to Heidi Collerin. All yours. Thank you so much. That's very kind, uh, Karthik. And thanks again for the invitation. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk uh, about the idea of natural fertility, uh, which is a concept that permeates uh, evolutionary anthropology. and. I want to talk about why I think if we take cultural evolution seriously, we can't keep relying on it uh, in the way that we currently do. A lot of evolutionary anthropology is about understanding social and cultural dynamics in the past um, that we can never really observe or that we only have partial evidence about. And so we rely a lot on storytelling, on narrative to motivate as well as to make sense of our research like this artist's impression here of hunter-gatherer family life in the late Mesolithic. We see the representation of primitive dwellings, large animals caught through cooperative hunting, the manufacture of stone tools, the presence of commensal animals like dogs, the cooperative rearing of children, the gender division of labor, all based on partial and often contested archeological evidence. I want to ask, what gets left out of these stories when we use concepts that naturalize some elements of the behavior in this picture, but allows others to be culturally evolving? Mm -hmm. And so what I wanna do in this talk um, is four things. Um, I want to convince you that natural fertility is not a useful concept, especially for cultural evolution. I want to show you some quantitative anthropological work incorporating cultural evolution ideas into a study of demographic change. Uh, and that's based on my work on the demographic transition in Poland. I then want to show you why ethnography is essential to rejecting natural fertility and to contextualizing it. And that'll be based on ethnographic work I've done in Vanuatu. And then I want to give you a worked example uh, of how um, we can translate ethnographic claims into models that can help us uh, move this, uh, move ideas forward about the cultural evolution of reproduction, which is something that I'm really focused on uh, using previous research from the Gambia. So you may know that there's been an explosion of interest in the effects of human demography on culture in different disciplines, but especially in cultural evolution. And in particular, what's been a focus is how do macro level features like population size, density, age structure and connectivity affect the evolution of cultural and linguistic traits in the human past. Now, most of this research is focused on one direction of that relationship from macro level demography to culture and not typically the other way around. So if you pick almost any model, also in the broader population sciences, in demography and genetics, um, the assumptions about how demographic growth is achieved are quite ecologically deterministic. Broadly speaking, more resources is assumed to equal more people. And when you look at human population growth in the longest possible term, it certainly looks like basic resources are the only things that really matter for human fertility. 
For example, here you see uh, in the Neolithic, uh, the transition from a fluctuating equilibrium of low fertility and mortality to one of high fertility and mortality, which we associate with the transition to farming within the last 10,000 years. And we see what's called the inverse of this process in the contemporary demographic transition, uh, again, associated with profound social and economic changes that started in Europe around the time of the Industrial Revolution. And there's a revealing mismatch between how these two transitions get described in terms of the individual behavior that generates them, and in particular, in terms of the psychology. Um, and uh, this is how uh, the paleodemographer Jean-Pierre bouquet appel put it. He said that the major difference between the two demographic transitions is that the cause of the Neolithic one was unconscious, determined by the mechanical effect on maternal energetics at the invention of the agricultural economy, while the essential cause of the contemporary demographic transition was conscious, the will to control reproduction. Now, there's a clear narrative here that goes from ecological and physical determinism of reproduction in the past, where there's no consciousness about or control over reproduction, to modern autonomy and conscious choice in the present. And the aim of my research program is to draw attention to problems with this and other distinctions when it comes to reproductive behavior and to advocate for a much broader cultural evolutionary understanding of the micro foundations of demography in the past as well as the present. Because what can look like stasis at one level of aggregation can look very def uh, different at other levels. So across these different scales here, uh, our models assume what's called demographic uniformitarianism, which is that demographic mechanisms are the same no matter what level you examine them at. We make assumptions about birth and death rates, sometimes age structure, that we assume to be universal to help us move between these different scales. Although the data that we have is often at different levels and it's hard to make uh, inferences directly from them. So we sometimes have uh, archaeological and genetic data at the regional scale here, but most of the social science, uh, anthropological and demographic data that informs our inferences about behavior is drawn from the micro level and even finer grained uh, spatial and temporal scales. So the point here is that even patterns that look like basic Malthusian dynamics are rarely quite so simple when you're talking about the behavior of individuals living under those particular conditions. And here's an example of what I mean from the Neolithic. So uh, these plots are showing you estimates of population densities based on radiocarbon dates uh, in different regions of Neolithic Europe. In red and light blue are statistically significant deviations from a null model of exponential population growth, with the blue arrows indicating the first evidence for agriculture in each of these regions. Now, in every case, agriculture is associated with booms followed by population crashes and recoveries. But in every case, those changes aren't associated with regional climate change. And that means that the processes generating those population dynamics are endogenous. They're not strictly ecologically determined. What could those population mechanisms be though? Um, cultural evolution teaches us to assume that ecological responses are mediated by culture, but the sociocultural processes currently still remain unclear. Now, compared to other great apes, human females reach menarche and start reproducing later. So if you just look at the plot on the left here, you see comparative uh, life histories broken down uh, across uh, a selection of uh, great ape species and the humans are on the right-hand side. Humans have uh, shorter interbirth intervals uh, and that means they wean their children early and can stack multiple dependent children. What that means is that they can squeeze more reproduction into a shorter period of time compared to other great apes. And this is the difference between the replacement uh, fertility that we see in, in other great apes uh, and the huge capacity for population growth we see in humans. Now we do all of this by getting other people to help. Um, so this idea that it takes a village to raise a child is baked into the way that humans reproduce. And uh, Sarah Hurdy has argued that humans are actually obligate cooperative breeders and that cooperative breeding permitted the evolution of among other things, extended lifespans, prolonged childhoods, uh, and big brains. And, and this is a uh, cooperative breeding system is similar to what we find in social systems found in some other species. Uh, and there's now a whole literature that examines uh, what's called kin effects on reproduction under this kind of framework and how things like parental investment differ depending on the ecological and social context. And while all of that work is about the, the social context of reproduction, it wouldn't be fair to call it a cultural model 
because ultimately the assumption that humans are cooperative breeders comes from the cross species comparison and not actually from an assessment of the cross cultural variation. And this cross cultural variation is really what's critical here because it's the elaboration of reproductive cultures that's critical for humans because humans marry and reproduce according to their own rules. So let me give you a really example, uh, a simple, really simple example from the field uh, of, of kinship studies. So you may know that in 1839, Charles Darwin married Emma Wedgwood, who was his first cousin. And like many gentlemen of his time, finding a spouse amongst your cousins was a conscious strategy. It was an important family concern. In the West, we tend to organize our families into this familiar kind of genealogy, which we call the kinship system. And these kinship terms, these labels here, they're not just linguistic terms. They are, they are features that structure people's roles and responsibilities in a particular society. And for the purposes of this example, they structure who you can marry. Now, what you might not know is that only about 11% of the world's societies organize their families in this way. But because this particular structure maps on to how we tend to calculate genetic relatedness, it's very easy to slip into thinking that it's a template for all of humanity. But that really isn't the case because kinship structures populations in diverse ways around the world, often that have little to do with genetic relatedness. So if Darwin had been born in Hawaii instead of 19th century Britain, Emma would have been classified as his sister, making their marriage impossible. And had he been born in parts of the Americas, she would have been classified as his mother, even though the underlying genetic relationships are exactly the same. This is a classic example of how culture influences marriage patterns and in turn, biological reproduction and its genetic consequences. Things that we can observe today and increasingly in the past uh, using things like ancient DNA. Now, cultural evolutionists are really interested in this kind of diversity, uh, diversity in the basic organizing principles of human life. We don't assume that before the Neolithic, there were no kinship relations or networks of, of exchange that were guided by language and culture. But we do tend to assume that the reproductive outcomes of these features are somehow not necessarily guided by complex cultural worldviews. And that's something I want to challenge. The situation is changing, but to the extent that culture is used in demography more broadly, and especially in evolutionary anthropology, it's best summed up by the anthropologist Eugene Hamill, who wrote about it more than 30 years ago. He said that the use of culture in demography seems mired in structural functional concepts that are about 40 years old, hardening rapidly and showing every sign of fossilization. Hamill argued that the study of demographic behavior has actually been hampered by the widespread use of the culture concept in different inappropriate guises. And he advocated a much greater use of fine-grained studies and ethnography. And I very much agree with him. Um, and I think that the main roadblock we need to get out of the way first uh, is natural fertility. So here's the definition. Uh, natural fertility is fertility that exists or has, exist or has existed in the absence of deliberate birth control. The factors affecting it are not solely physiological. Social factors can also play a part, sexual taboos, for example. And importantly, control can be said to exist when the behavior of the couple is bound to the number of children already born and is modified when that number reaches the maximum the couple doesn't want to exceed. This definition includes cultural mechanisms into the definition of something that is supposed to be naturalized. On the standard definition, reproductive control only exists if you have explicit numerical preferences and if you use modern contraceptives to achieve them. What's important here is that the idea of natural fertility turns less on the concept of biological versus cultural determinants and much more on the idea of passive versus deliberative, i.e. conscious versus unconscious reproductive strategizing. So in that sense, it's identical to the quote I read at the beginning. In reality, I want to argue there's no such thing as a natural state of fertility and naturalizing some people's reproduction over others is extremely dubious for a number of reasons. First of all, it lets us slip into thinking that high fertility is somehow unregulated and that low fertility is the result of conscious decision-making. That creates problematic dichotomies between so-called traditional and modern populations that is based on the number of children they have when instead fertility is a spectrum of diversity. It's dubious because it creates a biased narrative about human reproductive consciousness before the demographic transition. And it's politically dubious to think that reproduction is always a private domestic activity generally limited to women, when in fact, how, when, and where people reproduce is often at the core of political and social life. 
Our theorizing is substantially limited, I believe, because we make the cultural influences on reproduction invisible. And that's actually precisely what uh, researchers across the social sciences and humanities have been saying for decades. Reproduction is an invisibly central part of human social life, yet it's visibly marginal in our theorizing. And we currently don't have a way to integrate the work that's being done in many different disciplines, uh, much, of them, uh, much of the work qualitative, with the kind of debates that are happening in evolution and demography. So let me give you a few uh, examples of how varied different reproductive mechanisms can be and how they can affect micro-level demography. For women in parts of the Gambia, your age isn't determined by how many years you've been alive. It's determined by how much reproductive activity you've experienced. And you move between different indigenously defined age categories, depending on how you curate your reproductive career. For example, spacing your births and wasting less of the reproductive energy that God has determined for you. So when modern contraceptives were introduced here, it allowed women to more tightly control their spacing strategies, which actually led to higher fertility than family planning interventions had anticipated. And I'm going to come back to this example later on in the talk. In Indonesian Papua, the Marindanim had a practice called Otif Bombari, in which women had ritualized sexual intercourse with up to 10 men of their husband's clan on the night of their marriage or on their return to village life after childbirth. Now, while this was intended to promote natural fertility, it actually led to widespread sterility once sex, uh, STDs were introduced to the population. And as a result, between 10 and 25% of the population at any time was made up of kidnapped and adopted children from other groups um, as part of a rich cosmology uh, involving headhunting and expansionary raiding. In China and many other places, cultural preferences for sons over daughters have led to sex-selective infanticide and abortion generating extremely skewed sex ratios and a staggering estimate of up to 50 million so-called missing women in China alone. In Germany and many other countries, what we might call cultures of childlessness are developing that downvalue biological reproduction altogether. And that's leading to rapid population aging uh, with about 40% of Germans expected to be over the age of 60 by the middle of the century. We need to ask ourselves, do people really make decisions about reproduction in the same way in these different cultural environments? And how can we take indigenous categories and concepts more seriously when we do try to instantiate them? How do population level changes then affect how these kinds of cultural mechanisms themselves change over time? These are the kinds of questions that cultural evolutionists need to be able to answer. Now, one thing I want to point out is that natural fertility isn't synonymous with high fertility. So here are distributions um, of uh, total fertility among farmers uh, given in black bars and foragers and horticulturalists in the non-black bars. And all you need to see is that there is huge variation uh, and substantial overlap. So using a high or low fertility cutoff isn't going to help you determine if a population is a natural fertility one, because you can have a low fertility farming population and a relatively high fertility foraging population. But what looks like natural fertility at the population can also be completely socially constructed. So this plot um, shows you uh, distributions of interbirth intervals lengths in uh, on the bottom three lines, uh, three historical populations, and in the top two lines, um, African populations who were reported either using modern contraceptives or not. Now, the difference between the top two lines and the bottom three lines can be explained by cultural differences in marriage patterns um, where birth spacing is longer. But more importantly, the top two lines are practically indistinguishable from one another. And what that means is that we can't necessarily make inferences about reproductive intentions or action from population level data itself. It's just not enough to use aggregated patterns to infer those reproductive strategies. Coming back to the idea of natural fertility being about a lack of deliberative reproductive strategizing, contraception is always the first thing that comes to people's mind. Um, here's a list, uh, just a, a set of um, purported contraceptives uh, across the ages. Um, I'm not going to go into them in detail, but the point I want to make here is that if contraception isn't anything new, uh, then the motivation to do something about your reproduction is also not new. And that's the thing that we want to understand. Um, it's not about the particular methods, it's about the behavior. Now, you might be inclined to think, okay, but those aren't effective contraceptives. Um, uh, these are more the kind of things that we're thinking about. 
But uh, even uh, the best of these methods here uh, depend on perfect use uh, for their effectiveness. And uh, fertility awareness methods, for example, are highly accurate when used properly and don't require the use of so-called modern methods. Uh, as well, let's not forget that the demographic transition itself began long before the invention of most of these methods, and it was driven by coitus interruptus. Finally, birth control itself doesn't require modern methods uh, of contraception. So here's just some uh, data from uh, wealthy countries. Um, so if you just look at countries like Greece, Japan, Italy and Portugal, some of the countries with the lowest fertility rates in the world, uh, they're achieving low fertility using very low levels uh, of so-called modern contraceptives. So it's perfectly possible to reduce fertility using natural methods. Now, this lack of understanding about the mechanisms that drive reproductive variation has major political implications because it can lead to sensationalist claims about the future of the human population. For example, the population bomb here argued that hundreds of millions of people would starve to death in the 1970s. And that led to fundamentally unethical political proposals from forced sterilization to taxation on large families to the withholding of development aid to high fertility countries. And these predictions were totally wrong and not for the first time. Malthus also prophesied mass immiseration, but they're wrong because we simply don't know enough about why people reproduce the way they do in different cultural contexts. Reproduction isn't a, polit a politically neutral domain of life anywhere in the world. And simply focusing on food production and naturalized models of human reproduction is a convenient way to avoid dealing with massive structural and political inequalities that contribute to population issues, that contribute to the disproportionate effects of climate change in different parts of the world, uh, and to the lack of reproductive justice in many areas. Governments all over the world use reproductive policy to achieve reductions in fertility among undesired populations and increased desired fertility among others. Okay, a final thing I want to say is that some of the populations that I mentioned earlier would actually count as natural fertility populations, but others wouldn't. So the two populations on the left, the Gambia and the Marindanim, would be considered natural fertility populations, whereas the populations on the right, China and Germany, would not. It's not clear why we can only include some features that are social that influence reproduction and not others under this definition. And remember, the distinction is about deliberative decision making. So the implication here is that the groups on the left are deliberating less about their reproduction. And I think this is a very dangerous space uh, for racialized and other biases to creep into this definition. And it's the reason that we should expose it. So my research group in Leipzig responds to significant gaps in cultural evolution's understanding of microdemography. Um, and my group is dedicated to the cultural evolution uh, of reproduction itself, bringing more detailed demographic insights into cultural evolution. And for that to work, we use three different approaches. Uh, to, uh, we try to bring them together. Uh, these are field research that's both quantitative and ethnographic, quantitative analysis that's designed to explicitly incorporate cultural evolution principles and theory, uh, and modeling that takes ethnography and indigenous categories very seriously. And we use three guiding questions to reframe reproduction in the group. Um, we think about what kinds of mechanisms, uh, whether they're purely cultural, technological, or social influence people's reproduction. We ask how do cultures of reproduction generate demographic patterns? And we look at how demographic properties themselves potentially influence the cultural evolution of reproduction itself. And each of those components requires different empirical and theoretical tools at different levels of analysis. So the group is uh, a very uh, diverse interdisciplinary group. We have everything from um, uh, computer science to osteoarchaeology to social demography, cultural evolution and social anthropology um, represented. And uh, the researchers in this group are working together under a thematic um, banner. Uh, and I think that's what's really important here because we're approaching these questions from different uh, disciplinary traditions. So, uh, I've talked about why I think natural fertility isn't very conceptually useful. And now I want to show you some quantitative research uh, looking at the cultural evolution of demography. And that's based um, on my field research uh, in Poland. So in the last 15 years, I've developed two long-term field sites uh, in Poland and Vanuatu at two ends of the scale when it comes to ethno-linguistic diversity. Uh, in Poland, I've been comparing different reproductive mechanisms across high fertility communities without the confounds that um, ethnolinguistic variation brings to the story. Uh, 
And in Vanuatu, on the other hand, I'm exploring maximal variation in cultural uh, cultures of reproduction and how they influence uh, community demography. So I'm just going to talk about Poland to begin with. So why are Polish fertility dynamics complex and interesting? Look at the top two plots here first. Poland has one of the lowest fertility rates in the world with a below replacement TFR uh, of about 1.2 when I collected the data. Uh, and in the plot on the right uh, from communities that I worked with, uh, have uh, you can see that there's high completed fertility, so about four children per family. And this reflects a broad divide between rural and urban areas and between parts of Poland that were historically partitioned. So the bottom left plot shows you an example of cultural legacy. These are uh, basically just voting patterns from the 2010 uh, presidential election uh, with the historical boundaries of different 18th and 19th century empires overlaid. Now, Poland was uh, partitioned repeatedly between Prussian, Russian and the Austro-Hungarian empires. And my field project is in uh, the rural area in the south uh, of the former uh, Austro-Hungarian empire. The politics of reproduction are extremely polarized in Poland, and that partly reflects these historical partitions, um, but also the fact that reproductive rights are very fraught, even today, with the largest protests uh, since the 1980s happening just in the last years over access to abortion rights. Now, the rural communities that I worked in um, still have a very strong ideal of a woman as a bastion of national values, and large family size are, are really key to that. So it was in this context that I wanted to understand fertility decline in a rural, highly religious area. And I wanted to avoid just thinking about culture as a classifier and get closer to uh, cultural mechanisms themselves that might be driving fertility decline. And so that's why I wanted to focus on a largely homogenous population and look at micro scale variation in reproductive behavior. And that means thinking in multi-level terms and comparing multi, uh, multiple communities. So the message of the work that I'm gonna summarize for you now is that Explaining reproductive behavior requires measuring and analyzing features above and beyond the individual level. So uh, a paper that we published in 2014 was about community level education and how that potentially accelerates the cultural evolution of fertility decline. So here you're seeing plots of predicted probabilities from a multi-level model where a woman's number of births is the outcome and you're looking at differences across communities. So each dot represents a community. In the first plot, plot A, what you've seen is that average fertility goes down as average education in the community goes up. So women are having half the number of children in the most educated compared to the least educated communities. In plot B, you're seeing variation in fertility uh, going down as average education goes up. And that makes a lot of sense if everybody's getting educated and everybody's um, reducing fertility. So this convergence. Uh, and in plot C, uh, what you see, however, is a bit surprising. So here you're seeing variation in fertility against variation in education in the community. And you would expect to see the exact same pattern if what I've just said is true. Uh, but we don't see a pattern. We don't see that convergence happening. And what we see is that something else is driving the convergence on low fertility apart from educational convergence. Uh, and it's independent of individual characteristics. So what that means is that less educated women reduce their fertility in the presence of higher educated women, but they also tended to have more educated friends outside their community as well as inside their community. So we found that their networks were slightly more educated. And this is potential evidence for converging values based on social learning, either horizontally between communities or via prestige and success biases uh, within communities. We then went on to look at contraception and how uh, local definitions of contraceptives, which uh, we break into artificial methods versus natural methods, um, are uh, diffusing uh, within women's ego networks, within their personal uh, interaction spheres. And so um, here you see two different models where we look at the probability of using any method of contraception and the probability of using artificial methods of contraception, the more taboo methods. And what you see here is that social clustering is extremely important when it comes to contraception. So the more women in your network using a particular method, the more likely you were to as well. Uh, and this indicates a possible frequency dependence uh, within these ego networks. What we also found is that women were successfully reducing fertility, stopping their reproduction early and shortening their reproductive spans, mainly using natural methods, which were less taboo. And we collected uh, information on 15 different kinds of contraceptives. We also found that the more taboo methods, these artificial methods, were associated with levels of religiosity in the community. So um, in the sense that 
uh, even if you weren't religious yourself, if other people in your community were religious, you were much less likely to use artificial methods. But this didn't hold for natural methods. Um, and that indicates a possible role for um, conformity within communities in slowing down the spread of these artificial or more taboo methods. Um, and so the point here is that um, women are learning about contraceptives in their private social spaces in ways that might allow them to violate um, the group norms um, and allows actually the diffusion of these methods to occur independent of uh, sort of explicitly stated preferences. A third preference um, also from 2015 was focused on how the dynamics of wealth and status are also changing during this transition period. So uh, on the one hand, we know that um, the relationship between a positive relationship between wealth, status and fertility tends to reverse in the course of the demographic transition, uh, but also that wealth inequalities increase and then temporarily decrease as fertility declines. And all this change is happening simultaneously with all these other changes. Um, so the point here is that pulling out any one predictor just one predictor like women's education is only going to tell you about some elements of the mechanisms um, that are uh, driving fertility down in this context. Finally, I wanna tell you a bit more about one uh, more recent paper uh, looking at how the structure of women's social support networks themselves is changing um, in the course of extensive market integration. So I have data on up to five eco network partners for each of the 2000 women that we interviewed as part of this project. And we know how all those ego network partners, those alters uh, are related to each other. The density of these networks is high. Uh, on average, 80% of possible connections are present given the size of the network. And in this paper, I developed a new measure of kin density, which counts the proportion of ties between individuals that are kin ties, instead of just counting the number of nodes. Um, and that distinction is useful because they're, they're not really the same thing. Uh, if women add um, their husband's kin to their social support networks after they get married, which is very common, the kin density, the genealogical density of her network can actually decline, even though the proportion of kin in the network uh, doesn't change. And that really matters because there's a lot of evidence from the cooperative breeding literature that I mentioned earlier, uh, that women's and men's kin might have different effects on reproduction, but also there's this general idea that the more kin in your social support network per se, the more compounded the influence of kin on reproduction will be. And so we found that 38% uh, of possible connections uh, in those networks are kinship connections given the size of the network. But looking at this across communities, what I found was that kin density is lower in households and communities that are more market integrated even though overall density and size of the network isn't. So again, there's a multi-level point here, which is that independent of your own household's market integration, the integration of other people in your community somehow affects the loosening of your kin ties. And that's not due to a lack of kin, demographically speaking, or a range of other compositional features about these communities. It's about some elements of microstructure in your social interactions changing during these profound economic and cultural changes. Uh, and this is just one mechanism at one level of aggregation that's consistent with the loosening of kinship connections in this transition process. And while that doesn't mean that cooperative breeding isn't still happening, there are implications for how resources and information flows between individuals. Uh, and that is important for connecting to ideas in cultural evolution uh, at large. So just by way of a summary, what I want to say is that there's a lot of complexity when you dig down into these kinds of uh, questions uh, in, uh, in an empirical quantitative way. And um, the challenges that we need, individual, community and network characteristics, because they all matter for understanding demography. Now, cultural evolution and evolutionary anthropology needs to build on these kinds of foundations in addition to foundational analogies that are often made with population genetics. So this is a very... Um, a uh, strong um, influence of population genetics on cultural evolution models. Uh, and demographic data need to come before uh, our cultural evolution models are built. Um, the success of any sort of uh, generative simulation inference approach ba based on theoretical models really ultimately depends on the underlying uh, construction of those models. And those depend on us having this kind of detailed knowledge. Um, uh, so basically what we need is multi-level theory as well as data. Okay, I've told you about some quantitative work and now I want to talk about um, how I think ethnography is essential to rejecting the idea of natural fertility. And now I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, work in rural Vanuatu where I've been working since 2015. 
So Vanuatu, uh, for those of you who don't know, is an archipelago in the South Pacific, made up of uh, about uh, more than 80 islands um, and has a population of about 300,000 people. Uh, it was a joint colony of Britain and France until 1980. Vanuatu is famous for being extremely culturally and linguistically diverse. Uh, it's the most linguistically dense place per capita in the world with 138 Austronesian languages um, at the last count, so indigenous languages. Now, all the work that I do in Vanuatu is done in close partnership with the Vanuatu Cultural Centre and uh, a network of Indigenous field workers. Uh, so here I just acknowledge some of the people uh, who've helped to make this work possible. Now, the backdrop to the extreme diversity that we see today is a very complex demographic history which is short, um, but involved multiple waves of migration that brought groups with very different genetic, cultural and linguistic ancestries into networks of contact. So it wasn't until around 3000 years ago that the first people crossed the boundary between uh, what's called near and remote Oceania, which you can see here on the left, to reach Vanuatu. And that was part of the broader population expansion, which carried the Austronesian language family out into remote Oceania. In 2018, uh, we published a collaborative study that used a combination of ancient and contemporary DNA uh, collected as part of my field project uh, that showed that shortly after initial settlement, there was a process, uh, a, a long-term process of genetic population replacement that took place over about a thousand years with different peoples coming in from uh, near Oceania. So the plot on the far right shows you the proportion of Austronesian ancestry um, going from uh, the 3,000 years ago to the present. Um, and uh, what it shows you is that basically contemporary near Vanuatu people carry extremely high levels of ancestry from near Oceania. And the best fitting demographic model of this process is horribly complicated. So it's much more complicated than a simple wave of replacement. It involves multiple admixture events in the past. Uh, and, you know, and this is a topic of ongoing, uh, you know, discourse and uh, uh, research in, in genetics at the moment. Uh, but there's a bit of a paradox because um, Austronesian languages are still spoken uh, exclusively in Vanuatu today. Whereas the incoming populations, if they were from near Oceania, were more likely associated with uh, different language families. Um, and uh, so what we argued in this paper was that the ancestor of the current languages of Vanuatu was potentially used as a lingua franca by those incoming populations. Uh, and that speaks to the idea that there was ongoing extensive contact between different groups. Now, the archaeology of Vanuatu shows uh, evidence of extensive trade routes uh, and interaction spheres within Vanuatu. And uh, there are also macro cultural features that are very similar across areas of Melanesia, like pig exchange economies, uh, political systems and kinship systems. And these all have very important implications for the organization of reproduction in a way that just explodes the complexities that we have to think about when we're inferring demographic phenomena. So this, this diversity means we can't assume demographic uniformitarianism, even within one country, as, as we did in Poland. It's just the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of complexity. And so part of my ongoing work is to understand how demographic and social processes generated this diversity, but also how they maintain or erode it in the present day. So the project that I've been developing uh, is a high diversity complement to the Polish project. And so I collect comparable information, uh, but I also work um, in lots of interdisciplinary projects because there are so many aspects to these questions that uh, cannot be addressed by a single discipline. And a, a huge part of the work that I've been doing here is ethnography, participant observation. Uh, and the people that I work most closely with are the Big Nambas people of Northwest Malakula, which is the second largest uh, island in the archipelago. Um, and it's also one of the most uh, complex in, in the sense that um, there's about 40 languages uh, uh, attested on Malakula for a population of about 25,000 people. Um, so it, within the most linguistically dense place in the world, this is the most linguistically dense island. Um, and the Big Nambas are the largest ethno-linguistic group on Malakula. They have uh, a history of uh, demographic and linguistic expansionism. Um, they have a complex political system that combines uh, egalitarianism and hierarchy and a clan-based uh, structure. Um, but also they have an explicit ideology of lineage growth. Um, so what might look like natural fertility to an outsider is in fact a highly regulated and politicized um, activity. 
And it's really important not to treat indigenous reproductive dynamics as if they're somehow homeostatic or stuck, uh, frozen in prehistory. Uh, the damage that natural fertility does is to relegate some communities to being sort of pre-modern or unconscious of their own reproductive politics. The reality is that reproductive dynamics are always responding to current events in a particular place and time. So a major part of my work in Vanuatu is studying the impact of history, of colonialism, and of today's rapidly changing post-colonial context uh, on the, you know, on the cultures of reproduction. Uh, and so my fieldwork is based uh, around three sets of cohorts um, that capture many of the important changes. Um, so if, if you look two to three generations back, um, you have reproductive dynamics that involve strong customary traditions and language. They involve a rejection of, of the missions of Christianity. Uh, and actually they involve relatively low fertility because in the past men and women didn't uh, actually live in the same households and actually they preferred to have uh, fewer rather than more children. If you go one to two generations back, you see the erosion uh, and then the re revival uh, of customary knowledge and languages. Um, but at this point you see exclusive Christianity and widespread missionization. Uh, and you also see a rapid increase uh, in fertility driven actually by many of the interventions brought about by the missions, for example, um, people were um, encouraged and sometimes forced to live uh, together in the same household. And then in the current generations, you see uh, the loss uh, of customary knowledge and, and revival movements uh, to try and uh, reclaim them. Um, you see very diverse Christian denominations. Uh, the diversity has really exploded over the last 50 years. And you see the incipient demographic transition into all of the dynamics that are, that are going on there. And these are just some of the examples about what we need to think about because uh, you know, even these things uh, are, are, are things that I as an outsider am tempted to focus on. But of course, reproductive dynamics are indigenously defined. And so I work with a network of women involved in grassroots research to understand the detailed cultural mechanisms of reproduction here and how people manage fertility and infertility, uh, ritual and supernatural elements, uh, menstruation and childbearing, as well as uh, things like women's power and customary roles. Um, and the topic that I'm most interested in at the moment is infertility and, and how infertility mobilizes what we might call cultural technologies of reproduction um, and what they reveal uh, about indigenous attitudes to reproduction and demography. So the World Health Organization uh, defines infertility as a disease. It's a biological dysfunction in a specific embodied location. Uh, in Vanuatu, there's no uh, assisted reproductive technology. It's not on uh, the development agenda. And infertility is kind of an invisible problem because these are the kinds of places where it's desired that fertility be reduced. So infertility becomes kind of conveniently forgettable for much uh, development research. Um, and that means that it's reckoned with very much at the community level. So what happens to women in this community who can't reproduce? Well, it might surprise you that local responses to fertility often include anger, uh, demands for physical labor, uh, increased demands for sharing of goods, uh, demands for compensation payments, um, and for the policing of women's movements and speech. In extreme cases, it can lead to the withholding of food, information, and social, context, uh, social contact. And, and, and to Westerners, these actions seem really harsh because surely more support and food sharing or relaxation of garden labor uh, would relieve the physiological constraints on conception or maybe reduce psychosocial stress. These are the kinds of things that we would tend to focus on. But they're actually less salient in the Big Nambas context because reproduction, as in other Melanesian places, is not necessarily understood to be determined purely by, or even importantly by, physiological limitations. Instead, the major determinant of reproduction, and as a result, the, the target for correctional activity uh, when it comes to infertility, is the will and social comportment of the woman herself. And that's because infertility is not really interpreted as an inability to get pregnant, but an unwillingness to do so. And it's seen as an active attempt to block the continuity of the patrilineage. And to understand this, we need to appreciate uh, that reproductive activity and therefore reproductive responsibility is distributed among the women of a patrilineal compound, with the result that the costs of infertility are borne in complex ways by all its members. And there are important implications of this way of viewing uh, uh, you know, 
distributed reproduction for how uh, families are made. There are many cultural mechanisms, what I'm calling social technologies of reproduction, that actually facilitate this reproductive pooling. So for example, the kinship terms here blur the distinctions between biological and non-biological mothers um, and fathers. So all in marrying women into a patriline will be referred to as mother by the children uh, of the patriline. Uh, the big numbers practice lever at marriage, which means that uh, when a woman's husband dies, she remarries uh, his brother, but she goes down the birth order. And what that does is it keeps women um, reproducing within the patrilineage um, and also allows firstborn men to contract a polygynous marriage. And actually one of the kinship terms that's really interesting is that in marrying women are referred to by all the brothers as mother of our children rather than mother of my children, uh, which clearly indicates that there's a potential expectation that she'll reproduce with more than one brother. Children can also be easily incorporated into the lineage through cultural mechanisms um, that uh, effectively uh, pay uh, fines for uh, non-biological children to be incorporated into the patriline as biological children. And that actually means that reproduction uh, before marriage by women is, is often okay. So um, there are clear cultural mechanisms for incorporating those children. An important implication of that is men's political status can often be determined by whether and how many sons they have, rather than the other way around, because in order to obtain title uh, and um, access to land, um, you have to have sons to take your place. And so if you don't have any sons, that generates a whole set uh, of dynamics, including the incorporation of sons from other lineages. So in the ethnography of Vanuatu and other parts of Oceania, it's understood that while reproduction of a lineage doesn't properly belong to women in the sense that they're not entitled to a major stake in its political or social fate, they're nonetheless the essential conduits, the instruments of the production of men. And so they wield enormous power via their reproductive capacities. So the greatest danger that they can pose is to refuse to reproduce at all. Uh, Holly Wardlow, who's an ethnographer of the Huli in Papua New Guinea, calls this kind of refusal negative agency. And on Malakula, women who don't reproduce are sometimes seen to be in active conflict with the interests of the lineage they married into. And that sets off this whole host of social dynamics that are completely unexpected from a Western point of view. Understanding all of this means getting to grips with the broader ethnography of Melanesia. And in this region, what gets emphasized is how relations are created between people and how personhood itself is distributed uh, and relational. So, the idea here is that social relations are actually produced through exchange. They're not a given, they're not necessarily given. Um, a second point is that possessive individualism as we know it in the West is not actually that important. So for example, your labor doesn't imply your ownership of the goods you create and work doesn't produce alienable products that you can exchange without implying um, relations with other people. Your personhood, including things like your status, your gender, and your affiliation, is itself co-produced through those relations, exchanges, and through transformations that you go through throughout your life history. And as a result, um, the key ethnography in this region argues that there are no individuals, per se, in Melanesia. Persons, as such, are what's called individual. They're partial. They're not given a priori, and they're constructed throughout uh, the life course through these exchanges. Now, all of these ideas have important theoretical implications. Uh, they help us develop better and more ethnographically informed quantitative uh, data collection. And there are elements here that we can start with to develop models that better understand the causal structure of reproduction. We really just can't wave all of this away under the idea of natural fertility when it exists in a rich set of indigenous ideas about reproduction. It's a tiny example that I've given you, um, but we need to be reading this kind of literature much more. So just to summarize this work, in Vanuatu, different waves of history and prehistory, as well as the colonial experience and the dynamics of diversity have to be taken into account if we're going to understand reproduction. And before we can build any models, we need ethnography. We need to know the system. And that knowledge takes years. Uh, we also need to acknowledge and make space for that uh, in our research practices. And doing so involves working with local communities, which is critical to learning what those mechanisms and categories are that are most salient and important for reproduction.
So I want to finish now by explaining briefly uh, how we're developing modeling in the group to help us understand the effects of culture on reproduction. Uh, the ethnography in the previous section is a source for the kind of modeling we're already doing. And I just want to give you a test case example. So this is based on Caroline Bledsoe's research uh, in the Gambia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So as I mentioned, for women in the Gambia, your age isn't based on how many years you've been alive, but on how much reproductive activity you've experienced. Uh, and you move between different indigenously defined age categories, depending on how you curate your reproductive career. So here are the age concepts uh, and their associated biological age ranges. So just focus on the highlighted ones in pink. And notice that they span the entire reproductive age range. And which one of these two you fall into depends on the effects of births, miscarriages, losses, and insufficient recoveries after childbirth. Uh, these are events that use up a limited amount of muscles that a woman has. Um, this is the unit of energy that is, is used uh, in the ethnography here. And so becoming serifo, this category of serifo, means that you retire from reproductive life. But that can occur to you anywhere between the age of 29 and 47, yet largely due to stochastic events in your life. Uh, ethnography is the only way to get this information, uh, to understand that reproduction is regulated by these categories and identities in this place. But we also need to know um, if, uh, using quantitative data, if those indigenous categories actually structure demographic characteristics. So Bledsoe asked, how many more children do you want to have? And if we just focus on the women who answered none in black, we see on the left, uh, if, you, if you look at this as a biological age distribution, it gives you a linear picture of the increasing desire to stop reproducing. On the right is the exact same data distributed using indigenous categories. Uh, and here it looks like more of a threshold or a step function. What matters is if a woman identifies as serifa or not. But this isn't just culture as description, this is culture as causality. The causal logic of reproductive decision-making here is what moves women between the different categories and that can affect the demography. So here are some basic parameters that might go into configuring a model of this, which is something that we're trying to develop in the group. So here what we do, um, and this is work by Tom Holding, who's a postdoc in the group. Um, so here we define rules about how many reproductive units, how many muscles move a simulated individual into a new age category and how much birth spacing um, uh, moves a uh, Sorry, I've got, <laughs> I'm gonna go back here. Uh, and how much birth spacing uh, and baseline fertility rates actually uh, get modified in each category. Uh, so getting to this point is where, you know, is where the core of the work is. Uh, and uh, the next step is just to simulate the population level outcomes. So now I'm showing you uh, birth and death rates uh, over time uh, and population pyramids, just age distributions for two very simple uh, different scenarios. So on the left is a model of natural population growth natural fertility based just on biological age, and you can see it's growing rapidly. And on the right is a model that also incorporates the cultural age structure where the growth is slower. What's happening here is that women are moving into the serifo age group, that's the yellow line here, um, once they've used up their muscles, and that removes them from the reproductive pool. Okay, imagine that we add a family planning intervention to this scenario, which makes contraceptives freely available. In the baseline model, simply adding contraceptives uh, decreases the growth rate, which is what you would expect. But on the right, adding contraceptives actually slightly increases the growth rate. And that's not what we expect, but it's actually what happened in real world Gambia. And the reason again in this model is because of our cultural mechanism. With contraception, um, women waste fewer muscles, efficiently space their births and have more births overall. And that means that they move into serifo category later at a lower rate, keeping them in the reproductive pool for longer. So that yellow line is shifted, as you can see on the bottom there. Now, I think this is really cool because it shows that public policy interventions are interventions on cultural systems and not just interventions on baseline biology. It shows us why interventions that don't take culture into account can have unintended consequences. And it gives us insights into how interventions that change the cultural features themselves uh, are, are fascinating because if fewer people become serifa over time because of this mechanism, maybe the category itself will become less culturally salient. Uh, and these are the, precisely the kinds of processes that cultural evolutionists want to understand. 
So this is all about, this isn't about building perfect models. This is about taking uh, indigenous categories seriously and translating them into a form that allows us to explore if and how they modify already well understood biological and demographic processes. It's not to privilege them, it's to help us explore them. Um, and we can borrow lots of tools from demography to do this. And I really think that that will transform the precision of our cultural evolution hypotheses. But I hope it's also clear that we have to know the ethnography to be able to build those models in the first place. Uh, and so this is just an example uh, of um, a broader environment that we're building uh, in, the, in the department to try and um, expand this into an environment uh, for agent-based modeling for cultural evolution. So this will allow people to generate their own models, to guide their intuitions about how cultural systems work and to explore their long-term trajectories. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to release that uh, over the next years. So I just wanna summarize what I've talked about um, in terms of the lessons for what I think um, the lessons are for the study of culture and demography. I think that if we're going to take cultural evolution seriously, we cannot assume demographic uniformitarianism and we can't assume natural fertility a priori. We can't relegate reproductive behavior, which is central to human social life, to either a pre-conscious state or a set of self-organizing dynamics without historical or political context. Our theoretical models need to take those indigenous categories seriously and we need methods that allow us to do so because inferential methods, no matter how fancy they are, require salient, maximally informative data um, to unleash their full power. So we need this um, combined effort of ethnography, quantitative analysis uh, and modeling to take this forward. And so before we build any models, we need to know our mechanisms. And so that's just a call to recenter ethnography into evolutionary anthropology to help us move uh, the field forward to describe empirical phenomena and articulate new hypotheses. And that's uh, the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, we have uh, plenty of time for questions. I see a lot of applause. If you wanna ask a question, raise your hand, either using that little emoticon or make yourself visible or in some other way ask. Anybody? No questions? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll ask a question just, uh, Heidi, on the last part. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's always struck me that, um, I don't know if you think about it in this way, but I'm thinking about an analogy with eco economics where uh, there is a lot of very abstract, very mathematical modeling. There's also a lot of very empirical work, but there's a whole big intervening layer, which we might call econometrics where the goal is to try to build models that somehow better interface between the kinds of data that we can observe and intervene upon and the kinds of models that we build. And it's always struck me as a huge deficit that in the evolutionary kind of social sciences generally, and as an example, cultural evolution or cooperation, stuff, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. We, we, we build models with things like fitness, whatever the hell that is. Uh, and then we make these very kind of qualitative -y kinds of predictions from them. Is that sort of, is the goal to see something like econometrics? Is that, does um, that make sense? Is I would say fair? no, I would okay, <laughs> in the no. short term. Let me, let me give you a couple of, I mean, response to that. I mean, no, not in a rejecting sense, but I, I think we need new theory. And I, th I think what you're saying is absolutely right. Basically, the theory um, in cultural evolution, you know, it was never designed to meet data face to face. It wasn't designed for that purpose. Right. And that's fine. That's fine. It, theory has its own role. Um, but we are missing, exactly as you say, this mid-level set of um, detailed mechanistic models um, that um, enable, they need to be flexible, they need to be, um, you know, interactable with, um, and they need to be uh, much more detailed. And, and, and the, the, the problem with requiring that of theory is that it, it's, you know, there's literally unlimited models that you could build, right, to, to address any one set of theories. And I think that's what I might, you know, microeconomic theory is trying to do. But um, I think what I think we should do is I think we should start 
by to build that theory, we should start from the qualitative insights that we have. We should start from the empirical reality and we need flexible, I think, software solutions to help us instantiate uh, those hypotheses into uh, you know, qualitative models, like agent-based models or whatever, that allow us to explore the implications of our, our intuitions at scale um, in a way that doesn't force us into a particular set of modeling assumptions per se, and isn't too strict. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to um, build an environment, a software environment that will be super user friendly and won't require that you become a mathematician or um, that you necessarily have to be even brilliant at programming um, to use because there's incredible um, there's an incredible amount of knowledge about and intuitions about how the world probably works, but they're not, there's just no space to, you know, instantiate them because you have to make them fit the mold of these very high level, very abstract models. And they're just not designed for that purpose. So there's nothing wrong with the fact that they're not designed for that purpose, but we need to build that infrastructure. We need an infrastructure for instantiating hypotheses. Are you, are you familiar with, sorry to follow up, but um, the work of Steve Lansing um, in mm -hmm. Bali is a good example where I think back in the 80s, building these very intuitive models of water management. Uh, um, yeah, exactly. I think it's, it's a perfect example of where the field needs to go. And um, the challenge, of course, is making that user friendly. Yeah. Um, because, you know, at the, in the current moment, if you want to build a model of whatever it is you're working on, you need to find an expert and you need to, you know, get them to spend time on your question. Uh, you need to learn a language, basically, to be able to communicate with them and to make sure that you're actually speaking about the same phenomena. And they need to do a lot of work to understand what you want. And it's quite a, it's quite a time consuming process, but it's also quite a, an inefficient process because there just aren't enough modelers <laughs> in the world who are- or Some kind of protestation, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, Protestant reform. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we okay. just need we need to make we need to democratize the modeling yeah. in the sense that we need to reduce the barriers to entry. Um, uh, and that's not to reduce the, the status of modeling or to reduce the, you know, to diminish the craft. Um, I have the greatest respect for modelers. You know, I'm married to a modeler and, um, you know, it's not to try and diminish either side. It's rather to create an infrastructure in which they can properly communicate um, uh, and in which the benefits can be mutually beneficial. Because, you know, frankly, most ethnographers um, don't care about modeling the systems or the communities or the cultural features that they're working on. But they might want to know, um, are there, are, you know, are there large scale implications of, of this system in a, in a very general qualitative sense? And so that can be extremely powerful um, to be able to instantiate. I have another follow-up then. Please. How do we train students? Uh, so I'm thinking of, I, I think what you're describing is better done in disciplines like physics and economics, and maybe to some degree in biology. And I think one of the reasons is that in the graduate student training, they are not specialized in a method right at the beginning. They go through a more generalized kind of education and then they go off in their own kind of way. But in a discipline like anthropology, and I don't know how that's going to change, you know, because it seems like what you're saying is the ethnographer at whatever stage in their career should be able to jump in then and start playing with these models rather than reformulating the educational experience in which ethnographers are introduced to model-based thinking early on and theorists are forced to read more ethnography earlier on. Yes. Um, and I do think some disciplines solve that problem in a better way through their graduate education. We don't do that in anthropology. Yeah, I think, it, I think that's a really tricky question because I think, um, I think, um, I don't really know what I think, actually. I don't know if we should be <laughs> indoctrinating people or forcing people early to, to you know, um, necessarily learn the techniques of everything because all you know as you know all of these um different specialties you know are crafts that require years and years and years of investment and, and skill so um you know specializ specialization is really important i think um i think you know in the short term i don't know about long term in terms of education but i do think in the short term software is really helpful 
um, and user-friendly, simple software. And I don't mean software like R, I mean, you know, graphical user interfaces that are easy to play with, that don't require um, a mathematical training, but that that introduce you intuitively to kinds uh, to concepts about population thinking and to concepts of scaling um, are really potentially very powerful. And so that's one of the major outputs that I'm hoping <clears throat> we can start uh, trying to produce with my group is um, software environments that are co-produced by people who are um, modeling specialists, but who who know what you know what kinds of things the modelers need to 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 show. Um, but also by people who are not inclined normally to use models. So I really want to, you know, confront people who are not convinced <laughs> by the usefulness of models um, because they're the people that we really want to um, bring in. So, yeah, I don't know if, 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 if forcing it down people's throats will be the way to do that, but I think um, making it exciting and showing people um, uh, what, you know, what they can do with the work that they've already achieved um, you know, potentially, hopefully will be of interest to them. And if nothing else, um, what I would do to sell it would be to say, you know, this is an empowering technique because uh, a lot of qualitative researchers are really frustrated by the way we do anthropology, right? Because um, they see the numerical side of the field as having more power and um, they don't, uh, you know, get a word in or get listened to. But these are, you know, these are potentially incredibly empowering ways to, you um, Make your make your claims uh, understood in the lingua franca of science. Good. Um, okay, I have a question online uh, from the chat box. I will read it out loud. Dan Kelly is a philosopher at Purdue and cannot ask the question because he's in a very loud coffee shop and doesn't want to <laughs> bother other people. So I will read the question. Uh, you had a slide that had a picture of a book called The Gender of the Gift and about a particular conceptual personhood that was distributed not a priori with individuals being prior to individuals. I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about that and how it connected to the particular kinds of social norms that govern fertility and reproduction. Parentheses, if social norms is a fair way to, of conceptualizing a lot of what you were saying. Okay, um, so yeah, the gender of the gift is, um, is probably one of the key texts in, in Melanesian ethnography um, by Marlon Strathern, who's, who's at Cambridge um, in the UK. And um, yeah, the idea is that Melanesian personhood is, is individual in this, you know, this is her concept that um, uh, it's used to just, you know, demarcate this idea of an individual that is bounded by the limitations of the body. And, um, you know, if, if you think about this in, a, in, in, the concept, in, in the context of, let's say a network visualization, when we visualize networks, we visualize nodes and vertices between them, right? And so we think of nodes as individuals and vertices as representing connections, whatever they are. And, and I guess uh, to simplify this radically, um, in the Melanesian context, um, those nodes can't be separated from, they can't be individualized in that way. They are inherently um, relational. They're inherently created by the vertices. Um, and are not sort of bounded individual atomistic units that interact with one another that have uh, alienable properties to do with their uh, their work and their investment of energies and certain things. Um, the very concept of, of, a, of a mother is, you know, um, constructed through the activities of a woman throughout her life cycle. The concept of a of a father is, is constructed through reproduction and other activities uh, and his uh, relations to other people. The concept of exchange, um, so let's say a family exchanges bride wealth in the form of pigs um, with another family um, in order for the uh, their daughter to be transferred to that other family. Uh, the, the pig can't be seen as an isolated um, item of exchange. The pig was reared by some, some um, a set of people, uh, usually women, fed by um, the items that grew in the land of that clan, um, which themselves are considered to have um, spiritual force and energy and which are um, growing in, in, in a cooperative relation with the people who water it and plant it and feed it. Um, in terms of the pig, and, and so exchanging a pig is is, is not a singular action. It is it is a it's a snapshot in time of the building up of relational networks uh, uh, of interaction between 
um, not individuals, but between whole collections of, of, of people that are, you know, extended through other networks, et cetera. And so this idea that um, this is all very individualizable and, and, and made into possessive individualism as we have it in the West uh, is really rejected in Melanesia. Though, of course, it's, it's changing because um, with, you know, increasing, you know, what's called the economization of life, we do have this shift more towards, um, you know, what we call individualistic tendencies, but they're creating a lot of issues because they conflict with a lot of um, indigenous ways of being and ways of understanding the world. And, and, and how that connects to reproduction is this idea um, that I'm calling pooled reproduction, which is that, you know, a woman's reproductive output isn't just her own. It belongs to um, her husband. It belongs to her husband's father. It belongs to her husband's brothers. And, um, you know, um, her infertility, especially, and this is why I think infertility is so interesting, reveals that to be the case because of the way that people react to it and the ways that they try to resolve it. Um, the ways that they try to resolve it are not about doing something to her body or doing something to her per se. It's about restoring harmony. It's about identifying where supernatural punishment has occurred. It's identifying why supernatural punishment has occurred, which is connected to um, her relationship to the land. And her relationship to the land is itself changed throughout her life history, precisely through uh, the bearing of sons, because Sons are under, so men in Vanuatu are often understood to be um, analogous to roots and women are analogous to birds, which fly from place to place. So you have a lot of um, exogamous marriage. So women tend to move uh, away from their patrilineal community uh, marriage and, and move into their uh, husband's community. Um, but women literally put roots into the ground by having sons who will be buried in that ground and who will become the ancestors of the future um, patriline members. And so um, there's this, um, there's just, you know, you can't understand anything about how reproduction or basically any part of social life works in uh, Vanuatu and especially uh, and in the broader Melanesian context if you only think about individuals. Was that helpful? I hope so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, we have a question from Martin Daly. Hi, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you. I wonder if you can say a little bit more about Vanuatu. I was surprised um, out of sheer ignorance to learn about the degree of linguistic diversity. And I'm wondering why, why would 40 languages have been able to persist on a single small island? Um, why isn't, you know, sort of the either conquest or the um, dominance of a larger group such as to lead to more language extinction? Yeah, it's a it's a fantastic question, and it's the question that you know I think everybody who works in Vanuatu would love to know the answer to. Um, I think there are uh, there's lots of things to say. First of all, um, yes, your your question is about you know why isn't there some centrifugal force that just homogenizes everything, right? What keeps boundaries there? What keeps diversification uh, from collapsing? Um, and we know that the history of the languages of Vanuatu is very short. So we know that there was nobody there 3000 years ago. And we know um, that those languages diversified uh, since that time. So it's an incredibly short and incredibly complex um, history. And so if you're a biologist and you think about languages as species, you might think about this as a kind of island population um, model. So you might uh, imagine, you know, species, you know, hopping onto a new island, then having this rapid burst of diversification and then slowing down and then moving to another island, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we can, um, I think it's fairly clear that that's not the case um, in Vanuatu. And um, the second thing is that um, in other places in Melanesia, like Papua New Guinea or the island of New Guinea, you have even more radical um, linguistic diversity. So all the languages in Vanuatu are part of one language family. They're part of the Austronesian language family. Um, there are 15 attested language families uh, on the island of New Guinea. Um, and a lot of that variation, um, or some of it anyway, is uh, considered to be the result of isolation. So you have geographic boundaries um, that uh, might lead to isolation by distance. Um, again, that's not what's happening in Vanuatu. There aren't those kinds of geographic uh, uh, boundaries that are creating um, difficulties for language groups to, or, you know, speech groups to, to interact with each other. So the answer has to be something uh, that goes in the opposite direction, which is that it's precisely through contact uh, 
It's precisely through social processes of differentiation that these linguistic um, variants are able to be maintained. And that's something extremely important to understand about Vanuatu, which is that there's incredible tolerance for diversity. There's an incredible respect for, you know, the customs of the neighboring group. Um, it's not about um, trying to take their customs or trying to, um, you know, take uh, the customs from somewhere else. It's very much about, you know, the land that we live on is our place and our place has uh, linguistically defined rituals and uh, life cycles and material culture and origin myths that are ours. And um, we, we keep those and we don't want to lose them. And everybody has this real sense of both the importance of the distinctiveness of their own uh, group and respect for the distinctiveness of other groups. And that's called um, egal uh, Melanesian egalitarianism in the anthropological literature. And um, in the linguistic literature, it's also called uh, linguistic um, egalitarianism. So there's this incredible tolerance for, for diversity. Uh, to the extent that, um, I'll give you an example. I always describe um, Nivanuatu people as the opposite of the French. So um, if you try and speak French to a French person and you get the pronunciation even slightly wrong, they will not understand anything you've said. And um, uh, the opposite is true in Vanuatu. If you try and speak an indigenous language, however garbled and horrible you've made it, they will interpolate. You know, they will interpolate the meaning and they'll be like, gotcha, I know what you're trying to say. And there's this, and, and I think there's something about this. I think there's something really interesting to be done here in terms of um, not only the sociolinguistics, but also the psychology of how this works. Because, and I have no idea how this works because I'm not a linguistic psychologist. But um, I think there's something going on with this interpolation phenomenon um, that is really crucial to understanding how people are so incredibly tolerant of diversity and yet so good at holding on to their own, um, their own linguistic and cultural features. And, and people are extremely multilingual. So I did a survey as part of my research on multilingualism, and I'm, I'm actually starting a, a big project on multilingualism starting uh, next year. Um, and, uh, you know, my preliminary data indicate that people are able to speak at least four languages. Um, and, um, and we're not talking just dialects here we're talking you know on Malakula you've got the, the same kind of linguistic diversity that you see in all of Europe in a population the size of a town um, a small town in the US right and uh, so it is just incredible and, and I mean we've got to remember that multilingualism is probably not a new phenomenon right multilingualism is probably the ancestral state um, and humans are perfectly capable of, of learning multiple languages and interacting in them is, so is I think a... I, sorry go ahead I was just going to say, is there a single lingua franca for governmental purposes? Yes. So um, the, the de facto lingua franca is Bislama, which is an English-based creole. And in addition to Bislama, um, there are two other national languages, which are French and English, because uh, Vanuatu was a, a joint um, administration of, of Britain and France until 1980. And uh, Bislama is part of a, a suite of, of creoles uh, uh, that, were, uh, that sort of evolved um, through uh, what's called um, blackbirding, um, which was indentured labor uh, networks in the Pacific um, that happened uh, about 150 years ago. So, so people were taken from their native communities and brought to places like Fiji and uh, Queensland to work on uh, sugar plantations and, other, and cotton plantations. And um, all these people came from all over the Pacific and were brought together to work together. And they and they invented these, these incredibly... Um, uh, creative and amazing um, creoles that, uh, they, that they then brought back to their home communities. So uh, in Papua New Guinea, you have Tok Pisin, which is very similar to Bislama. You have Bislama in Vanuatu and you have Solomon uh, Pigeon in, in, in Solomon Islands. So um, these are all, you know, cognate languages as well. Um, and uh, Bislama is definitely the lingua franca um, in an informal sense, and in government, it, you know, it's usually English uh, followed by French. But the schooling system is duplicated. So you have French schools, you have English schools, and the state schools tend to use Bislama. They're trying to get uh, school uh, materials in the indigenous languages, but you can imagine how difficult and complicated that is when you have, you know, up to 138 <laughs> languages and, and very small speech communities at times. But yeah, it's it's... The, the Nivanuatu government is, is stupendously creative and uh, very impressive for its promotion uh, of indigenous culture and language.
Okay, any other questions? There was a question, I'm not sure, this was somebody who left quite a while ago. Correlations between the density of kin relations and conceptions of land use or land reform. I'm not sure when in the talk that would have arisen. Um, I think that- I don't think you mentioned land reform, did you? I didn't know, but I did talk about density of kin connections in, in Poland and how they're declining. Yeah. As uh, So maybe that's to do with land reform mm. in the sense of decline of yeah. uh, peasant farming. Mm. Not sure. Well, unfortunately he's not here. Okay, uh, anybody else? If not, maybe we can let Heidi go. Okay, well, thanks again. Thank you so much for your invitation and thanks so much for your, uh, for your time and for listening. It's really fun.